Okay, our next presenter, please welcome to the stage, uh, Paulina Soto Robles from the University of Arizona. Uh, her presentation is titled Evaluating the Multiskill Atmosphere Geospace Environment Model Through Comparisons with Auroral Observations. Thank you. Is the mic working? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Paulina Soto Robles. I'm from Mexico. I study at the University of Arizona. I'm a junior undergrad majoring in astronomy. Uh, my mentors this summer were Dr. Michael Wilterberger and Dr. Wen Wing Wang. And what I did this summer was evaluate the performance of the MAGE model through a comparative analysis with the MSRL observations. So I would like to start uh, this presentation by defining the concept of what is space weather. So space weather refers to the dynamic and ever-changing conditions in the space environment surrounding the Earth, driven by interactions by the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, and atmosphere. Space weather can occur anywhere from the surface of the sun to the surface of the Earth. As space weather storms leave the sun, it passes through the corona and through the solar wind. When it reaches Earth, it energizes the Earth's magne magnetic sphere and accelerates the particles uh, on the Earth's magnetic field lines, where they collide with the atmosphere and produce all sorts of phenomena. Um, each component of space weather can have different impact on our technology. So this is why we care about it. So it can impact our satellite communications, navigation systems such as GPS, or power grids, pipelines, astronaut safety, it can increase atmospheric drag, it can affect climate and weather and our polar regions. For an example, in 1981, there was like this situation in Quebec where there was a major breakout of the power um, and it affected six million people. So now, what is this big name that I gave in the beginning of the presentation? So what is a multi-scale atmosphere geospace environment model? So it's a physics-based predictive model of storm, storm time geospace, which means the system of systems representing interconnected physical domains of the near Earth environment. The MAGE model will span the domains of geospace from the lower atmosphere to the thermosphere, ionosphere, to different regions in the magnetosphere. It will resolve global dynamics and critical mesoscale processes uh, with highly precise technical techniques. I talk in a future tense because this is an ongoing model. Right now, they're in phase one, so they have fully two-way coupled the Gamera model, the RE-CM, the ring current model, and they have done the TCM model that will be substituted by the WACCMX model. So in simple terms, it's a big model that will predict space weather in lots of different regions on Earth and near Earth environment. So how are Earth related to space weather? So auroras are directly related to space weather because they're one of the results of their geostorms and are the most visible and fascinating manifestations of it on Earth. So auroras, also known as northern and the southern lines, or borealis and australis respectively, are natural light displays that occur in the polar regions near the Earth's magnetic poles. They're caused by the interaction between charged particles from the solar wind and the Earth's atmosphere. So on the right part of the slide, I'm showing a really simplistic scheme of what steps needs to happen for an aurora to form. So first, the solar wind approaches the Earth. It interacts with a magnetosphere. The charged particles that come from the solar wind enter the atmosphere where they interact with the atoms, excite them, and emit visible light. So now to the research part of my project. So as you might remember, my purpose was to evaluate the performance of the model using aural observations. So for this purpose, I had two data sources. I had the run uh, results from the simulation, the MAGE model, and we used them as on-ground all-sky imagers that are mostly located in the United States and Canada. So on these two movies that I already played that and I hope you saw are just the evolution of the, of the aurora on November 4th in 2021. And you also can see the names of the instruments uh, that were used in the FEMIS all sky imagers. So why did we choose this date? So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on solar physics 
So solar cycles refer to the periodic variations in solar activity that are approx approximately 11 year cycles. These cycles are characterized by changing, changes in the number of sunspots, solar flares, and coronal mass ejections, which are pretty much just a uh, uh, mass of plasma flying through uh, space and into Earth. Uh, during solar maxima that we are actually reaching is where most of these geomagnetic storms become more frequent and strong, and it should be here around 2025. So geostorms are becoming more frequent right now. So in November 4, there was this big geostorm. There was actually a really two recent ones that happened in March and April, but due to limited data, we couldn't work on them for the purposes of the research. On the first plot, you're looking at the disturbance storm time index, which is just, just a fancy word for how we are able to measure the perturbance on the Earth's magnetic field. And so a more negative number means a stronger perturbance on the magnetic field, and a closer to zero positive means almost no perturbance. So as you can see, at 9.15 UT time, it's one of the peaks for the DST index, and it matches with the activity, the overall activity from the simulation results at 9.15 So in the plot that you're looking in the downside of the slide, I integrated the total energy flux uh, from the results of the MAGE model and over the whole day. So as you can see, the times matches, and the yellow line only is there to show you the second peak that happened on the DST index, but by that time, the, for chemical and physical processes, it was already under recovery time. So that's why you don't see another peak on the real activity. Here I'm showing a little more background on auroras. So auroras have three phases. They have growth, expansion, and recovery phases. For the purpose of this research, we only were able to concentrate on the expans expansion phase. But for a fun fact for uh, aurora hunters, this is the stage of the aurora that they're usually looking for because it's when it's the brightest. Um, so yeah. So now onto the data analysis. So as you might have uh, realized, on the first two movies. The Themis Olsky imagers gave us uh, the data set in terms of intensity, while the uh, MAGE model results gave us in terms of energy flux. So there's a discrepancy on the terms of units that we're working with. And also, I will go more in depth a little bit later, but we had to go into some grid resolutions with this. But for the first part, the resolution for both was the same. It was one uh, degree per, one latitude longitude per grid box for both of them, so we, we didn't have to worry about that then. We normalized the data on a scale from zero to one, and on the first two plots, you're just looking at the data set, normalized values, and magnetic local time, so if you remember the polar grid, the midnight in magnetic local time represents 180 degrees, so you're look, we're looking at midnight and before midnight around 135 degrees. What you're looking at is where, at what latitude, the, uh, the rural activity happened. So as you can see, at a given moment in time, which is 1235 UT, does not happen in the same latitude. So they don't happen at the same place. Um, and on the plot on the right, it's just a more generalized view. It's a full width half maximum, so the width of that uh, peak. And you can see that on the MAGE model, the full width, full half maximum is more constant. It doesn't show us more as much movement as it shows in the semi sky imagers. Okay, so here, the times that you're looking at is zero, seven UT, and 10 UT. They were random times. They don't have a specific purpose. Uh, but what's important to look at here, it's, it's pretty much the same thing as the last part, is looking where the activity, like at what latitude happened, the activity peak um, throughout the polar grid. So, you're looking at from five magnetic local time through 1 p.m. So, so yeah, you can see there's not a lot of correlation between the two data sets. So now, the important part of the research. So about a week ago, we realized, we realized that the data that we had gotten from the semi solska imagers uh, captured cloudy data, uh, which was giving rise to a decreased quality of the data sets overall. And you can also tell from the movie that the sky coverage was not extensive. So we're comparing the observations uh, with the model, but the model has these data sets from the whole polar grid, while the 
same with all sky uh, imagers, only pretty much concentrate on the second quadrant. And there's like uh, blank spots of data. So last week, I rerun the code, and this is from the, the new data set, which doesn't show as much uh, discrepancies as the other ones, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, same thing, we're looking at a specific um, region of the polar grid, uh, right before midnight, so right before 180 degrees, so still the second quadrant. And we're looking where, uh, what latitude the activity peak happened. So for this, I run in different times and different uh, regions in the polar grid. And, but for this specific timing at the peak, at 9.15 UT, uh, we got a root mean square error of 0.45. So since we normalize the data from a scale to zero to one, this is a pretty significant error, um, which tells us like there's a big discrepancy. So key takeaways. So we found discrepancies between the two models, both MAGE model and the observations indicating variations in auroral peak locations at a specific moment in time. Uh, the limitations of the predictive model and limited spatial coverage contributed to these uh, differences, and we got a significant error. When I rerun on different times, the error was between 0.3 and 0.5, so the mean was 0.4. Um, so future work. So we know that there's a lot of work still to do on the MAGE model. As, as, I, to, as I told you, we're still on the first phase and we're, there's still a lot of physical process that need to be added to the model for it to give an accurate prediction of what space weather is. One of them, uh, I know they haven't implemented the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, so that should give, uh, they, that should have a, real, a really big impact on the data sets that we have. Also for, Having better comparisons, it would be nice to improve the models with resolutions because uh, the University of Calgary, who are the people who provided us with the Themis All Sky Emerges data sets, uh, they're moving into a bigger or better resolution. We would be at about a third of latitude per longitude per grid box. So we have to match it to be able to compare it with the uh, major model results. Also, it would be nice <laughs> to have a uh, a more extensive data coverage covering the whole polar grid, the 360 degrees and multi-time, and excluding cloud obscure sites from the, from the files. I would like to thank uh, my mentors, Dr. Michael Wildberger, who was uh, working remotely with me, Dr. Wen Bing Wan, Dr. Long Lee, which was not my mentor, but uh, for his patience, <laughs> uh, Jerry Sikan, oh yeah, Ben and my fellow Nessie Cypress Source interns, and NCAR and NSF for this opportunity. Questions from the audience, Joe? Great talk. Um, uh, so yeah, my question, <laughs> is have you ever seen Aurora Borealis in person? I have not, and I want to. Like, I will for sure add some point in my life, but I haven't yet. So um, congrats, it was really good. So like you say, you got your data, like your current data one week ago, right? So just like want to know, like how do you feel like all this summer working with a not a good data and at the end just like getting, so how was like the experience because research is not linear and this is a, an example of how you're like spending 10 weeks and then you had, oh, this is not what I was expecting. This is like cloudy data. So I just want to know your experience about that. So it was really stressful at the beginning because that's not what I had planned. So it completely changed my plans. But at the end of the day, it was not such a huge change because all the code that I had used for the past data applied to the new one. Um, so in, in terms of that, it was fine at the end. Hi, Paulina. Great presentation. I'm curious, um, what causes like the different colors in the auroras? So I'm just gonna go back because I have a little picture on the pretty much hidden on the corner. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it. So, <laughs> so the colors depend on the wavelength of the light emitted. 
So it determined the specific atmospheric elements and its electric state and the energy in the particle that hits it. So for example, at higher latitudes, the green and red colors are given by oxygen particles, while at lower um, altitudes, it's given by nitrogen. And if you go even lower, it could be hydrogen and helium, but uh, they're not seen as much. Thank you, Paulina. That was really cool. Uh, I have more of a technical question regarding code. In fact, mm -hmm. what was your experience in working with data? Did you have to pick up new skills? You just mentioned some code, your old code applied to the new data. Like, what do you even do this analysis in? Because I have like no idea. Your polar plots looked like they were Python. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I did use Python. I don't. I know that for the model they use Fortran. Um, but for terms of my research, I choose Python. And what was the other part of your question? So I had previous knowledge, not as much though, because I took my comp like programming class at the beginning of my college career, and I'm already almost three years in, so it was a while ago. Um, but I don't think it was as bad, mostly because um, my mentor provided me with these tutorials from the model, so like pretty much a rewrite of the Fortran code into Python so that I could like read it and understand it. Um, but yeah. Perfect. Any other questions for Paulina? Thanks, Ben. Awesome job, Paulina. Thank you so much. Can I?